Hey everybody, welcome back to the ECG of the day. My name is Reed, and don't forget that you can download the PDF of today's ECG, this document, down in the description below in the link. And uh, if you like this stuff, this content, please think about liking this video and subscribing to the page. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I like to do is look at the forest and the trees of the forest where my QRS complex is. And so if I look down here, maybe at this rhythm strip, you see I've got a narrow complex rhythm that seems to be uh, quite regular. But then I noticed that we've got some early beats that seem to come in. We've got this one is early. And if you keep kind of scanning through the rhythm, you can see that we've got maybe some early beats there, right here. Well, maybe it looks like an early beat. We have an early beat here. So they kind of just don't follow the normal uh, rhythm that we have. Um, you can see that there are P waves before my narrow complex QRS is. So that makes me think that we've got um, some you know, resemblance of normal conduction. And so let's go through our evaluation. So the first thing we'll do is we'll evaluate what the atria is doing. You know, we have a narrow complex rhythm. And so usually when you see that, you think that we've got at least conduction coming down the AV node and through the his Purkinje system rapidly through the ventricles to depolarize the ventricles, which makes me think that there's probably some atrial activity that's driving the AV node. And so here we have P waves that are upright in lead one and appear to be upright in AVF. And so those are likely sinus P waves. Another way that you can kind of understand if it's a sinus rhythm or not is just look at the rhythm, right? We've got a regular rhythm generally with some early beats, but that regular rhythm has a rate of maybe 300, 150, 100, 75 or so beats per minute, 75 beats per minute. And so that's about in the range that you'd expect the sinus node to beat, right? 60 to 100. And so now we can kind of look at our intervals. And the interval I like to start with is the PR because that measures my AV nodal function, which is next in line. And you can notice here that if I find a QRS that starts maybe on a solid line, if I can scan through and see one, maybe... Um, I don't see when that's perfectly, so we'll just kind of go here. We'll see this one lands right on that third line. This one starts on the second. And so I would say these are probably, that PR interval is six small boxes. And so six times 40 milliseconds per small box or per millimeter is 240 milliseconds for my PR. And so that is too long. So that tells me that there is some type of AV node block. Now we need to find out which type. Is it a first, a second, or a third degree AV block? Well, we see that there is a P that conducts to a QRS. For each of these beats, there is a P for every QRS. And I do not see anywhere where there is a P that doesn't have a QRS, right? If you just kind of scan throughout, I don't see P waves that don't have QRSs. And so if every P has a QRS, that tells me that the AV node is conducting every uh, atrial P wave to the ventricular to the ventricles in the QRS, and so this is a first degree AV block, just prolonged PR interval. And so the next thing we're going to do is evaluate our QRS complex. We see we have a narrow complex QRS that's less than 120 milliseconds. If you zoom in, you can see that this is less than three small boxes. You can see my QRS complexes are upright in lead one. They are down in AVF. It tells me it's going away from AVF, but towards the lateral aspect. And it's negative in lead two. So that tells me that it's going even away from lead two. So its axis is somewhere left. So this is left axis deviation. <laughs> so there are many things that can cause left axis deviation. One thing could be left ventricular hypertrophy, right? Imagine if this left ventricle was really, really big and strong, it would pull signal towards the left. I don't see that, right? I can look at the lateral leads. I don't see any left ventricular hypertrophy here. So maybe something down the road will help explain our left axis deviation. Um, my R wave progression, if you look here, seems that we've got, uh, I don't know if I see an R wave, right? I see a Q, but I don't see an R, so no R wave in V1, little R wave, and it starts to progress throughout, but you can see the R wave doesn't become dominant until leave 
5. And so that is a, we would say, a late R wave transition. Usually the R wave transitions to the dominant wave in the QRS in between lead 3 or 4. And so maybe we'll try to find something to explain that too. And then the last thing that we'll do in our algorithm is we will evaluate for pathological Q waves and ST and T wave changes. Pathological Q waves are going to tell us if there's any history of a prior infarction. Uh, and it could be prior meaning yesterday or 10 years ago. And then our ST and T wave changes might be some type of active ischemia. So the first thing that I notice is that we've got some ST elevations in my inferior leads. Mostly within the inferior leads, it's really AVF in lead three, right? If my baseline is here in lead three, and then there's my ST elevation. Same thing with AVF, baseline, ST elevation. And I've even got a little bit here in lead two. So that tells me that there's ST elevation predominantly, lead three and AVF down here, so I'm concerned for an inferior infarct of this region, right? Lead 2 is capturing just a little bit of it, right? Since it's going to capture kind of this aspect. And so where do my eyes reflexively go? They reflexively go to the opposite leads, which are leads AVL and lead 1, to see if there's reciprocal ST depression. And so that's exactly what I see here in lead 1. There's my baseline, and there's my ST segment. Same thing here in AVL. It's my baseline, my ST segment. So we've got some reciprocal ST depression in my high lateral leads, leads AVL and lead one. And so we're not done yet, right? So the first thing we think of when we see inferior, inferior ST elevation, first thing you should think is a right coronary artery, right? We just did this yesterday, right coronary artery. And we know that the right coronary artery is represented and in, in feeds the, some of the right ventricle as well as the inferior portion of the ventricular myocardium. That's why we have inferior SC elevation in leads two, three, and AVF. But in 80% of the time, the right coronary artery also feeds the posterior descending artery. And if you notice, there isn't a lead that represents the posterior aspect of the ventricles, right? In my transverse plane here, I've got these leads that represent kind of the anterior aspect, right? As we're kind of looking here at the anterior wall of the myocardium. But I don't have any leads that are, you know, back here that are looking at the posterior wall. But what we can do is almost use my anterior leads as a flip-flop mirror image of what I would expect to see on this side. And so what I'm getting at is ST depression in the leads that measure the anterior portion of the heart, such as V2 and V3, if you notice we've got significant ST depression here, and a little bit here in V3. If you flipped that over like a mirror image, it would essentially be represented like this. You would take a big QRS with some ST elevation if we flip flop that. And so it can kind of signify infarct in the posterior wall. So this is representing posterior involvement by seeing um, the depressions in V2 and V3. And the way I know that is because of the elevations here in my inferior leads because I know the anatomy that the right coronary artery feeds the posterior descending artery 80% of the time, meaning 80% of the people. And so that is kind of their, our ischemic work up there. You can even see you know, pathological Q waves. We've kind of got these deep waves here in my uh, inferior leads. Tells me that maybe you know this ischemic changes, maybe these haven't been you know, going on for just an hour, maybe it's been, you know, maybe a little bit prolonged and we're starting to see some permanent damage to the inferior aspect of the myocardium. So the last thing we need to do is we need to evaluate these early beats. We said we had these early beats here and here maybe, and maybe here. And so the first thing I do is I notice that they are narrow complex rhythms that tell me 
that, that tells me that it's coming at least from the AV node and being conducted down into the ventricles in a, in a rapid fashion. And so I need to look in front of them and see, is there any atrial activity? And I do see right there this little bump. That's a premature atrial contraction because that's a P wave. So we have a PAC here that conducts to that QRS. So there's one PAC. Here we have another premature beat. It's narrow complex, so I need to look in front of it and see, is there a P wave? And you might say, huh, I don't really know if I see a P wave there, but you need to compare the T waves. And if you notice, there's this little notch right on the top of that T wave that if you compare to the previous T wave, isn't there. And that is a little bit of a P wave that is hidden or buried within that T wave. And so that is also a premature atrial contraction that conducted to that QRS. And you see the same thing here in this last one. So we've got some premature atrial contractions that are conducting to um, the QRS complex in the normal fashion. And so we put this in ECG all together after doing that. And what do we get? We've got a sinus rhythm at a rate of roughly 75 beats per minute. We have a first degree AV node block. And we have ST segment elevation in the inferior leads predominantly lead three and lead AVF, but also a little bit in lead two. We have reciprocal changes that are noted as ST depression in the lateral leads, leads one and AVL. And we do have evidence of posterior involvement with ST depression on uh, the kind of anterior precordium. And then intermix here, there are you know, various premature atrial contractions. So that is the rhythm here. Um, remember also that the right coronary artery supplies our SA and AV node. And so perhaps, you know, this first degree AV block could be new and it could be due to some of the ischemia that this person is experiencing via the right coronary. So I hope this helps. Um, you'll see a bunch of right coronary artery infarctions throughout these ECGs. Learn to understand the subtleties and the small variations from each one and um, and then you'll learn to really appreciate the anatomy and these things will just start popping out right at you. So um, take care. We'll see you tomorrow. Subscribe to the page if you enjoy uh, these videos and yeah, have a good day.